Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at McDermott, Will & Emery, and the Chartist Group. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We'd like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Stay on after the webinar and prepare to have your mind blown with mentalist Mark Tolan. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from McDermott, Will & Emery, Stephen Bernstein. Welcome to Behind the Front Door, a digital facade or a digital care enterprise. I'm Stephen Bernstein. I'm the co-leader of McDermott Will & Emory's Digital Health Practice, and we have wonderful panelists for you today, true leaders in their field, where we're going to discuss and work to uncover how we can build a healthcare system that can, will, and must not just open the front door using digital tools, but efficiently find ways to ensure that patients and their providers can not only just navigate getting up the steps to the front door, but through it to reach key parts of the overall system to resolve existing ailments and diseases and to find other hallways in the healthcare home, as that term is used figuratively and literally as a term of art, to identify preventative care tools. Right now, the system got by on pivoting during the pandemic to find ways to allow many, but not all, to access care remotely. But that effort was recognized, I think, by all of us as a mere stopgap, stop gap, and it was a clunky approach. Now is the time to look at what was done and to identify ways to make that interaction significantly simpler, and let's call it a one-click experience. Right now, it's simply not that. Today's panel will explore the drivers of how organizations can approach the associated clinical, operational, and economic elements behind the front door to seamlessly integrate the increasingly digital points of entry corresponding with the house of the clinical operations. And to bring us into this home, let me introduce our wonderful panelists, each of whom has experience and has walked these hallways successfully with their organizations and their clients. Sara Vezzi, who is the Chief Digital Strategy Officer for Providence St. Joseph Health, where Sara leads digital strategy digital partnerships, business development, commercialization, and technology evaluation, all as part of Providence Digital Innovation Group. Providence, for those of you who don't know, is a nationally recognized health system known for the effectiveness of its digital health strategy and implementation. Dana Gelb Safran, Senior Vice President for Value-Based Care and Population Health at WellHealth, where WellHealth has developed an intelligent communications hub used by providers to more easily engage patients with a dynamic, two-way, personalized suite of digital connection points. Dana's role is to expand the platform's uses to improve quality, outcomes, and affordability through partnerships with payers and accountable care organizations. Tom Keesaw, who is a director with the Chartist Group and the leader of Chartist Digital, that's the firm's business unit dedicated to digital transformation planning and execution across the healthcare arena. Tom is highly skilled and practical in advising health systems and others in mapping both strategy and technical implementations of their digitally powered suite of services. Lisa Mazur, my partner and co-leader of McDermott Will & Emory's digital health practice, is nationally recognized as a go-to thought leader and implementer of telehealth services and as a wizard when it comes to helping clients map through the patchwork of laws, regulations, and operational components when providers roll out national digitally delivered platforms. Just a reminder, we'll look to address your questions a little bit as we go and also afford time at the back end. If you have questions, please drop those into the Q&A feature and we'll monitor those throughout the program. So without further ado, let's jump in. I'm gonna turn it over to Tom, who's gonna to provide us with the framework to view not only the digital front door, but the back hallways and what matters when one takes on the building of a digital home so that it's consumer friendly and operationally effective. Tom? Hey, Stephen. And I'll, I'll quickly walk through a couple of slides because I know no one wants to listen to consultants drone on about the slides they made, but. It is a helpful framing. I think it'll be useful as we get into the client examples that, that we can all talk to, as well as what Dana and Sara will talk about of, of their uh, supporting these digital transformations. And we hear a lot the term, the front door, the digital front door, and, and we like to use this as a framing to be clear on what we're talking about. 
And I think we could all point to examples uh, in any one of these domains, but understanding to what and how the front door connects to what Stephen was alluding to is critically important. And making sure we're not just creating this far left side, the digital facade, and it's actually doing something that's integrated into care delivery. It's not a freestanding capability. And I think this is important for you know, lots of the different uh, constituents that are listening to this, of whether you're the provider of the technology, whether you're a health system, whether you're a payer, the, the digital entry points need to be integrated into something. And far too often they're not. But there's really two points. There's the digital front door in the, in the middle here to really integrating into legacy care delivery capabilities and making it easier to access those capabilities, which is important. It is better than the current state from, for most patients. Um, but what we really wanna to start to think about is how we create digitally transformed care and how that digital front door integrates into all the different capabilities, virtual, proactive, um, physical, to be able to transform the way care is delivered in a completely unified manner for the patient across all sides of care. And as we talk about that, if we go to the next slide, I'll just kind of hit the key points you're gonna hear a lot of talk about today. Um, if we can click forward. Thank you. And this is a cliche many of you probably heard, going from doing digital to being digital and, and really going from the digital facade where you can point to it and say, look, we, we have something digital to this is how we operate our business. And what we're seeing a lot of care delivery focus on are turning on solutions. It's a capability we can point to it and say, look, we have a virtual care platform. We have an app, we have a CRM, we have remote patient monitoring. But what we really has to extend beyond it into what we're gonna talk about today is how it supports a transformed business process, understanding how stakeholders are impacted, understanding the business case, the ROI, the long-term definitions of success, and then ultimately, building the enterprise to support that, whether it's the governance model and executive oversight, resourcing the transformation effort, changing the operating model to, to launch and support an entirely different set of digitally enabled capabilities and then putting the tools in place to manage that across the organization. So we wanna turn it over to a couple of our other partner panelists here um, to talk a little bit about some of their initiatives and how they've done this migration from doing to being digital. And I'll uh, turn it over to Sara to talk a little bit about some of her experiences. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's great to be here today. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to bring to this conversation both a bit of theory as well as a bit of um, practical operator experience um, by way of a bit more um, context around the digital innovation group and um, what we do within the organization. So um, as, uh, as Stephen noted, Providence is a large integrated delivery network. We have over 51 hospitals. Uh, we have 51 hospitals, over a thousand ambulatory sites. We're vertically integrated. So we have a health plan. We have a school, um, a high school, a university. We do supportive housing. So we're really kind of um, present in, in um, both healthcare as well, uh, healthcare delivery as well as sort of determinants of health. And we take a very holistic approach to achieving our vision of health for a better world. That said, um, technology has been um, quite an important part of that journey in terms of delivering on Health for a Better World, and we have multiple um, technology teams within the organization. The Digital Innovation Group specifically is focused on the consumer or patient um, experience from discovery through delivery and, and beyond even. So when we say discovery, like we don't think about um, you know, we'll sort of get into this more in terms of the discussion as well, but when folks like let's take virtual or telehealth, for instance, folks think about telehealth in terms of the infrastructure required to do a video conference between a patient and a provider that is delivery exclusively, but there are a lot of other enablers there's workflow enablers there's discovery enablers and um, and then there's what do you do after the fact to continue to engage patients on an ongoing basis. And so we really look at that full end to end picture from discovery to delivery through engagement and beyond, um, whether it be during an episode, between episodes, et cetera. So that's the, that's what our that's what our group is focused on. And um, and in particular, um, I, you know, and by the way, I will say this, we focus um, on that, but we work very closely with clinical operating partners as well as um, uh, other technology teams across the organization, like our IS team, um, uh, our information services team, um, to to make it all happen. Um, 
uh, I'll provide a little context around what we did specifically with respect to um, virtual and digital um, before and then since the pandemic. Um, our CEO, Rod Hockman, always talks about BC, DC, and AC <laughs> before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. We're still, we're sort of still, of course, in the DC um, period. Um, and uh, a lot has changed. So prior to the pandemic, you know, we had uh, robust digital and um, telehealth as part of that strategies. Um, a lot of the organization had really banded together to do that. Um, we had, for instance, I noticed a question from someone in the audience about acute telehealth and, and ambulatory telehealth. The acute telehealth program at Providence um, dates almost you know several decades um, and it has been focused on tele uh, telestroke telehospitalist telepsychiatry you know um, I won't talk too much about that today um, we've also even before the pandemic had kind of um, what we call uh, telehealth for or like what folks would typically think about like urgent or on-demand use cases um, and that one has had a very interesting transformation um, specifically related to COVID that I can talk about a little bit um, and, and then the third area is more sort of just general ambulatory virtual and digital transformation. Um, and uh, that has also experienced quite a transformation since COVID because we actually didn't do any of that prior to the pandemic. It was like a fraction of a percent. Um, and, uh, and so that on-demand um, bucket is really where we had the majority of our work before COVID and has have seen quite a transformation since. So, um, you know, we uh, the on-demand bucket. If you think about it, it's it's sort of this this type of care that has certain attributes that make it high velocity, that make it very shoppable, that make it um, really responsive to consumer needs, and a mechanism for driving growth, um, driving digital uh, transactions, which is the ability to either schedule online or you know conduct a visit online. Um, and we we have done that for um, many years. Now, what we realized over time was, you know, there's sort of kind of two, two ways folks think about it. They either think about it as, again, infrastructure, which is the ability to do these things. Um, and they just enable features and functionality. There's features and functionality in the EMR. There's features and functionality in many of many point solutions um, uh, out there. Um, and they just they just think about it that way. The other way people think about it is in the form of those point solutions, sort of at that application layer where, um, where you know, you can do a telehealth visit or you can do asynchronous care or things like that. Um, and what's been missing, and in particular since COVID, where we saw a 30x spike in um, telehealth visits, for instance, over basically overnight in, in March, um, is that there is a need for an operating system layer that takes and connects the infrastructure and the applications and actually makes them work in one coherent, cohesive experience. Um, and for us, it was in this on-demand care bucket. So um, with respect to on-demand care, what we've done is, um, you know, we have create, we actually developed a platform that um, does three things. The first is it does demand aggregation. So what are folks, what are customers looking for? And how do you actually translate that into bringing them into the system to get the appropriate care that they need? The second is intelligent navigation, so getting them to the right care at the right time, um, and that contains a lot of like clinical as well as non-clinical logic to get patients to direct them, triage them into the right, um, the appropriate care. And so it's not just it doesn't just stop at the front door where they look and then they you know they get pointed into some random asset or the experience just stops, right? It's not just about discoverability; it's about um, gaining like getting connected into an actual experience. Um, and then the third piece is a very important operational detail, which is supply demand matching, which is very hard to do um, on its own. Um, and healthcare is has historically not been great at doing that. But imagine now that you're not just doing um, supply demand matching like in a physical environment, but you're doing it in a physical and virtual combined environment. And as soon as you open, open it up to virtual, the degrees of freedom around virtual expand exponentially, right? So you could do video or you could do chat. You could do human powered chat or AI powered chat. You could do asynchronous or you could do synchronous. And you have to match all of these different um, supply assets to 
um, uh, to what patients are looking for. Um, and so we've actually operationalized that. And, um, and since COVID has happened, you know, we've been able to manage sort of the ups and downs of spikes um, with respect to demand. We've been able to direct folks to the right venue um, based on um, what their symptoms were, for instance. And it's all part of a connected ecosystem. And we think it can go a lot broader than on-demand care. Now that's a, another discussion and a journey unto itself. And it really gets into more of that sort of ambulatory, traditional ambulatory environment, which we can talk about. But that's the, you know, operationally speaking, that's what we've done so far. Um, and we've seen some pretty interesting um, stats associated with it. It's been a really um, powerful new customer acquisition tool for us. It's been a really powerful downstream revenue generator for us. Um, so over $30 million of downstream revenue has been generated. 30% of the patients that come in are new to us. Um, and we've been able to kind of connect with them on an ongoing basis afterward once we get to know them in that initial interaction. And so, um, you know, it's that, that's, it's the from discovery to delivery from a digital perspective tied into all of these back, uh, back office sort of operations that we've been able to achieve that we are continuing to push on, by the way. And as we get into these additional use cases around primary care and specialty care, it's going to be even more important. So I'll stop there for now. Um, I know that was a lot, but um, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg, I would say, which is getting to what Tom was describing. Um, and one last final thing I will say is that Tom, in, in his middle bucket, um, Tom had use cases written there as like a very, um, almost as, a, as a, just a small point. I actually think that's one of the most important things. It's practically um, impossible for a health system to do transformation um, across all service lines across the entire enterprise. So you have to pick some high value um, focused use cases that you can then apply this kind of um, wholesale kind of redesign to and then um, and then go from there. You can't just say, you know, it otherwise it just becomes grand vision and very difficult. There's too many interdependencies to actually operationalize. I'll stop there. Sorrow, incredible. I mean that is quite a roadmap. And before we go to Dana, I just have a quick question. Um, probably not a quick question for an answer. Is on the supply demand calculus. Is that being is that being powered by AI people? Is there someone who's a traffic control cop who's sitting there mapping that out with a headset? How does that give us a picture of how that works? So fundamentally, it um, you know it's driven off of data that we're able to gather based on what's going through the platform, what's historically worked, and um, and like for a given, let's just say for a given patient, for instance, uh, the flow for a customer would be they would come in, um, they would look for care based on certain attributes, then they would get matched to care based on certain attributes. This would be intelligent optimization. So there's not like a human being sitting there and saying, we think you're the right, you know, this specific thing is right for you. Um, and then, um, and so it's all based on data and intelligence. It's not, it's not like um, specifically tied into our call center yet for this kind of work. Now, over time, we actually think that there could be as, especially as care, like there's certain forms of care that are more complex. It can be a hybrid in some cases, you know, for more simple use cases. Um, just intelligent optimization driven off the data purely will work. And in some cases there needs to be a path to escalation for a human being to do it as well. So right now it's intelligent optimization driven off of some algorithms that our platform has. Yeah, very impressive. So Dana, let's move to you. Dana from Well Health is gonna give us some description and, and piece about really some of the technical tools that Well Health has, how it's been implemented, how it works, which I think will bring to life even more what Sarah was talking about in an integration setting. Dana. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, whoever's got control of the slides, if you could back this up to the cover slide. I'm not really ready for that one. There we go. Oh, the well cover slide. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I what I want to do is pick up um, from something that, that Tom said and that Sara illustrated so beautifully, which is about the role of digital to supporting healthcare transformation. And I want to take a step back from that to say, 
you know, where did this drive for healthcare transformation come from? What and what's fueling it? And, you know, I say that, um, and here I, I'm really speaking uh, from my experiences before Well, when I was on the executive team at Blue Cross Massachusetts, and then subsequently on the founding uh, team at Haven, um, that a big part of what's been driving this is that purchasers, um, in particular, employers who are the purchasers of, of care for so large a percentage of, of Americans have recognized that they aren't getting value for their money, right? They're, they're paying large sums of money and actually it's not delivering health, it's delivering services. And so um, in spite of uh, the, the contracts that they have with their um, carrier um, or the, the health plan, and the contracts that that carrier has with providers, employers started to add more and more digital solutions to try to bring value, right? So purchasing, um, you know, diabetes um, support solutions through any number of apps, mental health solutions, OB care solutions, piecing it together. And then uh, they started to find, well, they actually need another solution that would be the concierge to all of that, to tie it all together and to make sure that patients are aware of it, that their employees are aware of it and are using these things. And um, track from that to the work that, that I had the great privilege to be involved with at Blue Cross Mass, which was about payment reform, right? About changing the way we pay for care so that we're actually trying to deliver better health at a lower cost um, for the population. And I would say that payment reform and COVID have something in common. Um, sounds like the start of a riddle, but um, what do payment reform and COVID have in common is that they've actually demand that those who are providing care have to think outside the literal and figurative box of the four walls of the clinical setting to where patients live and work in order to make sure that they are taking good care of those people. Um, now payment reform does that because unlike a fee for service model where the provider is accountable for the patient who is in front of them for as long as that patient is there. And when that encounter or stay, if we're talking about a hospital is over, you know, you submit the bill and, and you're done. Um, payment reform models are saying you're accountable for that patient regardless of where they are. So um, you need to be thinking about what the barriers are for that patient to adhering to their chronic illness care or managing risks so that they don't um, uh, actually uh, develop into a chronic illness that they are at risk of developing. Um, and similarly, in COVID time, we've seen as, as both Tom and Sarah pointed to, um, and Steve did too in, in teeing this up, um, the, the use of telehealth and virtual care to reach beyond the four walls and be able to meet patients where they are because it was just um, practically uh, not possible to have patients in the clinical setting. Where all of these initiatives are falling short and where well comes in is that all of them are failing to actually reach the patient to the extent that they want to um, get the patient's attention and motivate the patient to act. So that's sometimes called the last mile problem. And Well is a healthcare communications technology company that really is designed to solve that last mile communications problem. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, yeah, um, what Wells customers who, uh, this is a, a company that's about five and a half years old, um, has about 200,000 users from healthcare systems across the country, and now uh, newly starting to have uh, users who are uh, in payer organizations, health plans. What they find in common is the use of Well is allowing them to achieve these three broad kinds of outcomes. Improving member or patient engagement and loyalty, it creates a much better experience as we'll, we'll see in a moment. 
um, enhancing staffing efficiencies. And you heard some of that in what Sara was describing, but by automating things that otherwise take an enormous amount of human time, you can actually um, not just create staffing efficiency, but create a better um, experience for your patients. Um, and then finally, uh, enhanced revenue. So uh, we can go to the next slide and just we'll go quickly past it. But you know, we all recognize that picture on the left as the experience that unfortunately we have in healthcare, right? Just fragmentation um, and frustration a lot of times uh, in the patient's experience as they try to navigate all the different channels. And what Well looks to do is really to provide a unified experience, concierge care, and interestingly, unified for the, um, the staff and the provider or payer organization as well, because it creates that air traffic control um, that I think it was Steve who referenced. Um, so let's see what it looks like if we go to the next slide. And I'll share an example of using well um, for helping to be sure that patients are getting their medications filled. Now, whether you're a provider organization who's just trying to do the right thing, a provider organization that has contracts in which you're accountable for quality measures and therefore want to be sure that your patients um, who should be on a chronic illness medicine are not um, forgetting or failing to fill that medicine, or you're in a payer organization wanting to be sure those things happen, Either way, um, you know, the, the use case that's on this screen really applies. And what we're illustrating here is a message that goes out to um, a, a patient, in this case, uh, the patient's name is Hayden, um, letting Hayden know that it looks like uh, his prescription for lisinopril is past due for being refilled. And because this is two-way messaging, not just simply a reminder to Hayden about something that he probably already knows, telling him to go take care of it, this is actually offering to help, right? Can we help you re re refill this medicine? And Hayden says, yes. Um, and then uh, auto automatically, there's not a staff member having to type all this out. Um, if Hayden says yes, asking, is this the right pharmacy based on data in the system about where Hayden last filled this medicine? And in this case, Hayden says, yes, please. And we, we tell Hayden, you know, we're, uh, we're on it. We're gonna get that medicine filled for you. Um, now let's take a look at what the staff view of that looks like. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, and in this scenario, what you're looking at, this is literally what the screen of a staff member in a provider organization or a, a payer who's using the well system looks like. And over on the left column, you can see a bunch of different um, uh, make-believe, by the way, just uh, for my McDermott friends, uh, names of, of patients. Um, and you see Hayden's name there. And let's say Hayden um, said no when we asked, is this the right pharmacy? Um, you can see the first message uh, in this channel um, in the middle says, patient uh, chose no patient will provide updated pharmacy information. Then the system automatically asks uh, Hayden, where would you like the medicine refilled? Um, and Hayden tells us uh, CVS. And um, then we tell Hayden, um, thank you. You can see the, the blue message at the bottom. Thank you, we'll, we'll check that pharmacy. But very importantly, you can see that gold box there where um, the staff are now flagged to, um, to take care of this for Hayden, right? So up until this point, there's just automation running in the background and nothing has to take the time of any staff member at this provider or payer organization. But now there's an action step and somebody needs to refill Hayden's medicine for him. So that, that yellow message is shown. And um, over on the very left side, you can see there would be a notification, a little red, uh, circle, much like you're probably used to with your email or your text messages, that if this is your staff console, it tells you, hey, there's something to look at in the well console. Um, so all of this makes so much more efficient and for the patient, so much of a better experience. Um, you can imagine if you're Hayden, you feel 
wow, my, my doctor's office or, or my, my health plan, if it was the health plan really is looking after me, you know, I, I didn't even ask a question and they just wrote to see if they could help me get my medicines filled. And, you know, what we found in a, a recent effort that we did working with a um, Medicare Advantage plan was a 12% increase in um, patients uh, in their members getting their chronic illness meds filled over the status quo um, and doing this much more efficiently than what they might otherwise be doing, which is having rooms full of people in call centers cold calling their members and almost never getting somebody to pick up the phone. Um, so next slide is just, you know, another illustration and, you know, we could go on and on and I won't because we want to get to discussion with you. Um, but here's another example of automations around appointment coordination. And this has been a huge advantage for, um, for both patients and, and for providers. Providers are seeing dramatic reductions in no-shows because um, you're not only sending out a one-way reminder to patient of a visit, but you're having patient confirm. That's integrated with the EMR. So if the patient confirms, that's noted. If the patient cancels, that's noted. We had many customers who uh, during COVID, if a patient uh, wrote back that they needed to cancel, had an automated message going out saying, if you're concerned about coming in the office, we can convert this, keep your same time and convert this to a virtual visit. Would you like to do that? Uh, but you can see in this case, if a patient wants to reschedule, you can um, surface um, the self-scheduling uh, function, which really makes it much, much better for patients than, than sitting on hold. So these, I hope, are just a few uh, examples um, for you all of, of what the digital front door can look like and feel like. Um, my last slide that I'll, I'll go to, and then let me turn it back to Steve, um, is just you know a few key things uh, about well. Uh, we are thrilled that we were just recognized um, by class as best in class in patient outreach. Um, and you can see at the bottom there that we have integrations with over 90 um, leading HIT solutions, including all the major EMRs, um, but many other solutions. And so that in itself can go a long way toward doing something that that Steve was talking about at the very beginning and that Tom illustrated. So the digital front door can be more than just a facade, but actually have integrated with it all those other apps and, and um, programs that a provider or payer may or employer may be wanting to give their population access to, um, do it through a, a unified channel instead of having the individual have to click here, there, and everywhere on their phone with, with different apps demanding their attention. So I hope that's a, a great intro. And uh, Steve, let me turn it back to you. Well, well, thank you, Dana. I think that's obviously a practical, and these are just one, you know, two little snapshots of how to implement this. And I, there are some questions in the chat feature, the Q&A feature, really want to open it up to all our panelists. So the one is a scalability and an implementation kind of question. And I, I guess for all of you, what are you seeing in terms of how these kinds of operational activities can be done from a small scale to a large scale? I think, I think one of the questions was saying, oh my God, Providence is huge. How do we do this for a quote unquote average physician practice? And I'm curious about what all of you have seen in your travels on small to large practices, large practices to small and how that's working. So, um, Tom, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I mean, I think the, as Sarah alluded to this, the danger of, of the big health systems is that they, if you try to take all this, it's just too much for any level of transformation. And, and the nature of most physician practices, they're hugely heterogeneous, right? And so there's actually some value. That the, if you can start small and de demonstrate some wins and, and kind of build some of the organizational competencies around driving the transformation, that's actually often how we would recommend to approach it. And to Sarah's point, being very clear about the use case, even within kind of a clinical setting or a subset of clinicians you're gonna work with. Um, so it, it's not necessarily a disadvantage. I think the, the challenge you'll run into is getting enough scale to invest in the resources to continue to, to keep going, to get you know, kind of that, that transformation flywheel running. Um, but again, if you track these programs right, you will see an ROI. And so 
it, this is something that's not limited to the, the big guys can do it and the little guys are locked out. If you approach the, the with structured business cases around use cases, there is an ROI for these. Great. And, and Lisa, I guess from your perspective, and you'll talk more about some of the implementation features, what are you seeing? I know in our client base, it really runs the gamut between big medical groups to small, even startups. So. Well, I think Tom raised a really good point about the investment. Um, so, you know, we've had lots of clients that have invested in a short term or like band aid solution to telehealth. And, um, you know, I, even ironically in March and April, we were shut, you know, they were shutting down their telehealth programs because they just weren't seeing the ROI. I mean, right at the beginning of the pandemic, it was shocking to see that some organizations had made that decision because they were just too expensive and too burdensome to operate. Um, while at the same time, everyone was doing virtual visits because it was necessary for infection control and other purposes. Um, so I, I think what Tom, you raised is a really good point. It's, you really do need to invest and to continue to build on these programs. It's not something that should be viewed as a short term or a, you know, lots of pilots happening, um, but it does need to be something that's viewed you know, as a longer strategic vision. And, Steve, and Sarah I can, from, well. Oh, I'm sorry. so sorry. I was just going to say, I can speak to it from the well perspective, you know, a very large uh, share of the customer base for well are smaller mid-sized practices. You know, increasingly we, we have enterprise uh, clients um, that, that are using the system. But if you think about some of the value uh, prop that I described for the provider, as opposed to the better experience for the patient, around staffing efficiencies and increased revenue and you know the avoiding of no-shows in and of itself, many of our clients have said is gives a, a threefold ROI on the cost of the product just to take down your no-shows from eight, nine, ten percent to you know four percent, five percent is huge value for for a smaller medium practice, no less a, an enterprise. So um, so we've seen that in our in our customer base. It spans the whole gamut. And Dana, um, one thing you may want to clarify, one, some of the, one of the questions was, is well supplying technology to the patient or do they need their own? My sense is this is text-based, your own cell phone works just fine. But. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. So, so it is multi-channel, so, but over 90% of the communications with, um, with patients or, or health plan members are by text. And that's the beauty of it. You know, we, there's good research now that um, a lot of the public does not want to have to download another app to do business with a company or, you know, doctor's office. Um, and, you know, there's been challenges even getting people to, to sign on to the portal, right, for the EMR. And so, um, so this works strictly on the phone. The SMS text channel is the main vehicle, though, uh, well, also works with um, interactive voice response, phone calls, uh, if a client wants to do that, or if that's the appropriate thing for a population or segment of the population, email, web chat, any of those methodologies work and, and the patient doesn't have to download anything at all. It just works with their phone. Can I um, go back, Stephen, to the yeah, previous yeah. question? Um, you know, I, I would say, um, it's, it is all about ROI as um, a couple folks have articulated already. And frankly, in the pre-pandemic days, there was basically very little ROI for the ways in which people were operationalizing telehealth. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, it, before we did what we've done with our platform, which has actually been live for much longer than um, than the than the pandemic, it's been you know it's been operating within our system for about four or five years now. Um, but like when we had on-demand telehealth, our utilization was extraordinarily low to the point where we were effectively paying you know like six hundred to a thousand dollars per visit because of one, the pricing model of the platform and two, very low utilization. And that was because the platform wasn't tied into anything else. It was just like this 
thing that hung out there um, and patients couldn't find it. If they did find it, they didn't know what it did. They didn't know what it meant to do telehealth or video visit, like all of these things. There's a lot of um, education and customer communication and there's a lot of work that needs to get done from a discoverability standpoint and it has to get integrated into a broader experience. And you really need to be able to um, get some operational efficiency out of it in terms of utilizing your staff more efficiently. Otherwise, all you're doing is just layering on costs and, 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 right? And so um, essentially, like, of course it was out of reach for a smaller practice. It's completely, um, historically, a lot of these, um, from the infrastructure view, a lot of these infrastructure or platform level, and um, pardon me, um, application level view, um, they just kind of layered on cost. And, um, and, and so what, you know, the next era of all of this that we're in now is really integrating into the existing operations, again, for specific use cases, starting and then expanding because it's just so complex um, and getting the growth value prop, the operational efficiency value prop, the um, all of these other kind of pieces of it um, in order to make the ROI work. And then by the way, also doing it in a way where the platform that powers it is SaaS, not like some old school, you know, tiered pricing model that um, that is going to be com again completely out of reach for smaller practices. So um, I totally get it. Um, it's it seems very complicated, like what we've done at Providence, but it's actually with this notion of like making this available with based on these kinds of things um, to a much broader um, sort of audience. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, a number of questions in the in the Q and A feature. I want to turn it over to Lisa a little bit because if the operational pieces are complex, obviously, but doable and feasible, I think at different levels, which Sarah is really emphasizing. I think Providence has the full continuum there, but there's also some legal and regulatory considerations that Lisa will cover just a thimbleful because there's a lot to get done. But all of these activities and implementations have to run on in parallel and connect with each other. So Lisa, why don't you give us a quick rundown to some just some of the legal considerations? Sure. We'll move quickly so we can get to the fun, the fun questions. Okay. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. So, so no surprise to anyone on this call, but um, you know, innovation has been limited in its ability to truly grow and to meet some of the goals and objectives that you know we've all been discussing on this um, on this presentation because of the healthcare regulatory laws uh, that exist. Um, these laws were put in place, you know, many of them predate you know technological innovation and advancements that really facilitate the types of offerings you know that the Dana and Zara and, and Tom described. Um, a lot of them were put in place you know during a, the digital health revolution as you call it, but they just didn't really hit the right targets. And as a result of that, we have a lot of different laws and regulations that exist today that were adopted with you know oftentimes reasonable intent or purpose, but actually end up really causing a significant rub between innovation um, and collaborations between healthcare and non- you know, traditional healthcare providers and non-healthcare providers, um, you know, as they collaborate to, to offer something like a digital gateway or a digital front door. So the list on this slide is really just intended to kind of capture the different considerations that we typically work through, what our digital health team of lawyers work through with our clients when they're looking to create a digital gateway um, or develop a virtual care program of sorts that, um, you know, allows for patients to better use and access and, and collaborate with their healthcare providers. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide and just we'll quickly walk through some of these issues. Okay. Um, so, so billing and coding compliance is something that I think is worth just spending a minute on. And, and Zara, you, you already kind of touched on this and set it up nicely. Um, but the billing and coding requirements for virtual care services have just changed significantly. Um, you know, during the public health emergency, we saw a lot of the longstanding uh, requirements for telehealth services, just as an example, just completely turn on their head. Uh, so the longstanding originating site restrictions and the geography restrictions, which have prevented telehealth services largely to be delivered into a patient's home, have now been removed temporarily. And um, you know those rules right now are the subject of a ton of legislation and debate at, at, in Congress and CMS right now. Um, but what we saw is all of our healthcare providers that had not been billing Medicare, for example, before 
the public health emergency literally had to ramp up overnight to tailor their billing and coding processes and procedures and protocols to now take into account the delivery of care to Medicare beneficiaries via telehealth. Um, it was a significant lift from a compliance perspective. And now we're in this kind of awkward place where a lot of our clients, our health system clients ha have revamped how they provide care to patients so that they can meet these Medicare code requirements and get paid for the telehealth services that they're providing. Um, they've, they've beefed up their billing um, and coding teams in order to accommodate and comply with all these new rules. But we're, we're at this weird, awkward purgatory right now where we don't know whether or not those changes are gonna become permanent or if everything's gonna revert back to the way that they were prior, prior to the public health emergency. Um, you know, my money is on that we'll absolutely see significant changes to the Medicare coverage rules, but we don't know how significant those changes will be and what that will look like. Um, that requires a lot of investment from, from developers of a digital health gateway to think about how they, how they tailor and design the ways that patients can receive telehealth services and, and make sure that they're able to do it in a way that, you know, facilitates reimbursement. Um, remote patient monitoring is another great example. So with RPM, you know, we've gotten a lot of great guidance, you know, over the past year about how to use those codes, when to use those codes, the timing requirements, the established patient requirements, um, which is fantastic. But they're still relatively new codes, and we're still learning a lot about how to use them. So it creates a little bit of a rub for how providers can deliver these services, which are so important to a successful, you know, digital gateway while at the same time kind of complying with you know, coding and billing rules that aren't totally clear just yet. Um, another sticky situation, it really is the, the state laws. Uh, so we mentioned you know, using telehealth tools. Um, there are 12 states um, or so that prohibit the use of a dynamic questionnaire and only require that you use an audiovisual platform when you do a, a, an, a telehealth visit with a patient in order to create that physician-patient relationship that's necessary to you know, issue a prescription. Then there's a, you know, 12 or so states that say you can use a dynamic questionnaire. And then there's you know, 20 states in the middle that say you can use a dynamic questionnaire and you can use a chat-based solution. Um, so the rules are just all over the board and it's really exhausting you know, to develop a, a digital gateway that's nationwide that facilitates you know, virtual care in multiple states when you have every single state have a different approach to you know, the modality requirements, the consent requirements, the licensure requirements. Um, and it, it requires a significant dedication of resources just to lay the very foundation that's necessary in order to comply with those state law rules. Um, you know, this is just part of why it's been hard to really develop a successful digital gateway um, you know, when the, the federal and the state levels at the, and at the state levels, they're just constantly changing. And um, there's just a lot of complexity in how you can develop a, a legal compliance strategy that meets you know, all those different requirements. And again, the fact that we're in a public health emergency where a lot of there, that there's a lot of flexibilities that exist have helped with that innovation and that takeoff. But now we're gonna have to think about how we can um, you know, revise these programs or you know, tailor them to meet you know, what the, the legal and regulatory landscape looks like post PHE. So we can hop to the next slide and I can move very quickly through that. Um, so just uh, one, one item to flag in here is, you know, the FTC, for example, and the FDA have both made just fantastic, you know, advancements, um, you know, in the way that they approach digital health innovation. The FTC has been a longstanding, you know, supporter of telehealth and has spoken out against states that have adopted laws and regulations that, you know, make it difficult for cross-state, you know, telehealth care delivery. Um, but the FTC is also focused on a lot of other things like privacy. Um, just today, we saw a settlement with a very popular women's health app um, for, you know, alleged instances of, of improper data sharing. Um, you know, there are so many laws on the books for privacy, literally thousands, and most of them govern healthcare providers. But there's quite a few, too, that, you know, could extend to wellness providers and, and apps. Um, we think this is going to be an area where state and you know, the federal government as well are going to continue to take a harder look. So we need to be more thoughtful in how we share data with healthcare providers, but also non-healthcare providers like wellness providers who may play a really critical role in that digital gateway and with like the engagement aspect of a lot of these um, programs. So let's hop over to the next slide. Oh, and this slide is the worst. It's absolutely, it's my, I hate this slide, but we share it with you for very good reason. Um, the point that, the reason that we share this slide with you is, is one, and it's to tell you that 
This is the slide. These are the issues, the consequences, the risks that the general counsel's office of all of our health system clients are constantly thinking about. So the opportunities for these digital gateways um, are immeasurable. The ways that they can change patient care um, is, is incredible. But that said, the risks and the stakes are really high. Um, you know, health systems have been on the front page news of newspapers for participating in digital health collaborations um, where something went wrong. Um, and so as lawyers, we like to show this slide just to illustrate, you know, what the different stakes are and why it's really important that the legal and compliance strategy be defined at the front end and then continue to, to, monitor, to be monitored and, and to evolve it and, and make modifications to it to reflect the changing laws and, and regulations and enforcement landscape. Um, so, so this is something that's really just a, a shout out to the general counsel's office of health systems. You know, it's important for the digital health companies that are collaborating with health systems to really understand that their compliance infrastructure is essential to the success of these programs because it's what is going to be necessary for the general counsel's office to see um, in order to get comfortable with these collaborations. And then I think we have one more slide on the legal issues very quickly. Um, so to close out on a more positive note, there's just been fantastic changes that have been made. Um, really, I'll just highlight one of them, you know, the anti-kickback statute, the OIG, uh, I think it was yeah, November 20th, amended certain exceptions to the anti-kickback statute and created new ones that are very much focused on encouraging patient engagement and care coordination and value-based contracting. So collaborations between digital health companies and technology providers and healthcare providers, whether that's a hospital, a health system, a physician group, whatever it may be, there are different, there are new opportunities and ways that they can collaborate with one another and potentially meet an anti-kickback safe harbor or an existing one that has recently been amended. Um, because the stakes are so high under the fraud and abuse laws for failure to comply. And um, you know, we've all seen the DOJ settlement announcements where there's usually like a billion dollars or more involved. Um, the risks are really high, but the good news is, is that the government recognizes that we need to encourage these collaborations, particularly if we want value-based contracting arrangements to succeed. And they've acknowledged that by making some pretty meaningful changes. Now, what these changes really mean in reality is something that's still being defined. Um, the different, you know, the use of, um, you know, value-based enterprises and other, you know, potential vehicles um, to support these programs. Um, is something that's a little bit unclear because the rules are relatively new. Uh, but that said, it's, it is a really promising step in the right direction. And if we continue to see this kind of momentum, um, you know, with, with changes to the federal and state legislation, in a couple of years from now, you may not even need Steve and I to be on this presentation. And um, I'm just kidding, we'll probably still be needed. But the point is, there'll be a lot more opportunities to find innovative ways for collaborations to exist without this pressing, um, you know, oversight of um, state and federal governments into how they're operated. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Steve. Okay, let's move to the next slide. And in the meantime, uh, Lisa, I think there was a question for you. Someone was asking, what do you think the chances are of having a national standard, whether that's privacy coding, reimbursement for telehealth that sits atop the, the state requirements? I've been keeping uh, my fingers crossed for 10 years, but I stopped holding my breath uh, a few years ago. The Uniform Law Commission is currently working on passing, um, you know, are developing some uniform legislation that might, you know, address some areas of, of telehealth, particularly like the modality requirements or consent requirements, kind of bite-sized pieces of telehealth compliance. But, um, you know, it's really hard to get 50 different states with, with different, you know, resources, different um, agendas to, to get in line and, and to adopt that legislation. So I'd be happy to talk with whoever sent that question because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really, it's a great one. Got it. Well, that's helpful. And a number of you have been asking, the slides will be available. The Health Go Live team will, will send those out to you. I just want to spend just a second on this most, uh, this next slide here. I think if we can, there should be a slide there. Yeah. Um, just a little bit on privacy and security, just a smidgen of it. And what I tried to do here was really come at this with a dual approach. You got to get your patients ready. You got to get your team ready. And those should be running probably simultaneously, but you need to get out ahead so that patients are ready. And to Sarah's point, 
patients don't know if they're going to need a brick and mortar visit or they're going to want to do a telehealth visit, but they need to be ready with the tools, the privacy terms and conditions, the acceptance of how they're going to do all of this in advance because they don't know, you know, when there's a snowstorm or there's COVID or there's other things that prevent them from getting to the physical place. And so when you get the slides, you can just take a look, but there's some steps that you can be proactive on both with your team, doing a security risk assessment, understanding the technology, figure out where you're going to store information that comes from a telehealth visit. What are the terms and conditions of when a patient would use the service and how they're going to get there? And I think you also need to pressure test the assumptions about technology access. Not everyone has internet. Certainly not everyone has a phone, a cell phone and many don't have computers and it varies by age, it varies by geography, it varies by many factors. And so you really need to take that into consideration when you're building that out. I don't think the privacy and security issues are daunting, but they are things that need to be tended to. And I think getting out ahead of that is simple or it's, it's more complex than it should be. But I think if you plan ahead, you can get out on that front. And so, you know, feel free to take a look at those slides. And as we get to sort of a conclusion, I actually want to go back to where we started and throw a question really to Tom and Sarah. As you look, and you could hear from some of the questions, some of this is pretty daunting. And I think the notion of prioritizing where you're going to go first and how you build that project plan, I'd be curious from Sarah and Tom's standpoint, where, where do you really start? How do you do that prioritization? And it's obviously going to vary by, by customer, client, et cetera. So Sarah, do you want to mention that? And then maybe Tom can bring us home. Sure. Um, I can uh, talk a little bit about how we prioritized um, our efforts. And um, there were a couple different factors. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm speaking a bit on behalf of our chief digital officer, who's my boss. And um, when he joined Providence uh, over seven years ago, he came from a disruptor, um, Amazon, and he had worked in their self-publishing and Kindle lines of business. And so he was very familiar with that sort of disruptor playbook. And um, he put himself in the shoes of the incumbent and said, what's gonna kill me first? And, um, that what's going to kill me first um, uh, question led him to the answer that what all of these disruptive forces in healthcare are starting to do is carve off the sort of high margin, economically um, beneficial patients um, and you know carve them out of the health system and provide them with services through you know their own platforms. So that was. Um, you know, that's the conclusion that he came to. And that's what, what disruptors basically always do is that they carve off, you know, um, Jeff Bezos is famous for saying, yeah, your margin is my opportunity, right? And so, um, and so what he, um, uh, you know, in healthcare, those patients are um, generally speaking, commercially insured um, uh, patients who have uh, what we call their digital free agents. Um, they're out there, they're shopping for care, they're doing um, whatever that they need to do to find the care that meets their needs, whether it's from a convenience standpoint, from a clinical standpoint, from a um, uh, accessibility, you know, whatever, whatever the, whatever the case may be, they have the options to choose. And, um, and so we decided to kind of take this very e-commerce and, um, uh, convenience and access oriented point of view. And that's why we fit, we um, we focused initially on this high velocity on demand care that is that has a lot of the attributes of care that patients shop for. Um, and it's patients that are often commercially insured and that, you know, um, they may then have babies with our system, they may get their knee replacements with our system, and, and that kind of thing. So that's why we started there. And by the way, we don't, um, you know, Providence is a Catholic not for profit healthcare system, we do that because it subsidizes our mission, and it enables us to continue to remain the highest, the largest provider of 
services to Medicaid insured patients or to uninsured patients. So, um, so it's really a, it's a mission enabler for us as well. Um, uh, and it allows us to kind of do so sustainably. So that's how we started. Tom, do you see yeah, clients? I would just, where, where do they begin? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it depends, right? But I think to Sarah's point, it really depends on what your position is in your market and, and what you're trying to solve for. I mean, we've done to one of the questions that was in the, the Q&A, we've built business cases for five different organizations around the primary care, digital first primary care models, right? And every single one had a different value and a different proposition relative to how they were playing with value or the, the dynamics of their local market, or is it about acquisition of patients? They all require the thinking differently about what the care model is. I think that the piece that I would make sure to hit on is don't just think about how do we use digital to integrate into getting patients in, you know, to help them schedule an appointment. How do you change care delivery? Because a lot of the folks on this call are organizations that are trying to figure out how to disrupt the status quo. If you're basing your business model on getting $130 for a primary care visit from a commercial, re uh, commercial reimbursement, you are structuring your business model to lose from the disruptors. And it's not gonna be sustainable. That is not gonna be the standard. If par payment parity laws are, there are some, I know this is a sensitive topic amongst the different stakeholders, but exactly to the Jeff Bezos point, that's opportunity for people coming in to say, we can do it for less than that. We can offer a more, more, react a more proactive, more engaged service and do it at a fraction of that price. And if, if, if the, the model doesn't change for everybody, we're gonna do it in a reactive way when someone does it to us. Very good. And I think with that, we're probably at time for those of you who pose questions. Apologies that we couldn't get to everybody's answers, but feel free to reach out. And I think health has a health organization has a special surprise with mentalists. For those of you who want some laughter here out of this and fun, probably at our expense, but um, we're happy to play, play guinea pigs on that. So over back to the HLTH team. And thank you all to our wonderful panelists who gave us all that they could in the short amount of time we had. So thank you for playing. Appreciate it. Thank you to Stephen and to all of our panelists. If you would like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now, please welcome mentalist Mark Tolan. Hey there, everybody. I'm Mark Tolan. I'm a mind reader. I'm coming to you live from Chicago. And don't worry, Stephen, nothing at your expense. It's all communal and we're all in this together. Um, so look, uh, in our short time together, I'm gonna try something. We got, we got more on than we thought we might. So I'm gonna try something with like several of you individually and then maybe as a group, there looks like one, two, uh, six of us on screen, which is perfect. And uh, yeah, well, I'll try to get to as many of you as I can in these uh, few, uh, few short moments here. Just one thing to keep an eye on, and that is this envelope right over my shoulder back here. That'll be important towards the end of our time together. So just keep an eye on the envelope. We'll get to that soon. Uh, but for now, maybe I'll talk with Lisa. I can see Lisa nice and clear. If you could unmute. Hello, Lisa. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. We've never met, right? We, we don't know each other. We do not, even though we okay. live in the same city. We have not okay. Oh, well, that's nice. Maybe one day <laughs> after all this is over. Um, but very important, just for what I do, that people know I don't know you and we haven't talked about this. Um, Lisa, quick visualization test just to get us started. This is just me getting in sync quickly. Picture yourself back in first grade. Okay, so years ago, you're back in your first grade classroom, but there's no one else in the room with you, right? So no teacher, no staff, no students, just you. So you stand up, you walk to the front of the room, you grab a piece of chalk and you draw a picture on the board of something very simple, a basic drawing. What comes to mind? My pet dog. <laughs> okay, I like it, I like it. And that popped in your head this second. Uh -huh. Okay, obviously there's a lot you could go for. You go for a house, a, a tree, a flower, a car, a cat, sun, smiley face, right? The, the list is pretty endless, but a dog is a nice, clear, simple picture. I like starting this way, Lisa, because I was also thinking of a picture myself. I drew it on a little piece of paper. I folded it up and I put it right here in this clip. So I want you and everyone else to see that we are off to a very good start. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> It's not too bad. And that's an exact likeness of Lisa's dog, in case anyone was wondering. Um, thank you, Lisa, for helping. Um, let's come down to Tom here, and I'll chat with Tom. Hello, Tom. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? Tom, where are you? Where are you right now? I'm uh, in Chicago as well. We're all oh, really? in the middle of this Fantastic. lovely Chicago snow apocalypse. Group. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's like up to our waist here if they if they plow it to the sidewalks today. It's wild. Um, well, Tom, nice to chat with you. Tom, I want to try, like I said, it's about getting in sync. And so I'm I'm moving through this very quickly today because we've got a short amount of time together, but I will just test this theory. And the goal mainly with that visualization test is you guys were probably all playing along. I don't know if you all thought of dog, but it starts getting our minds thinking the same way. I'm thinking you and I may be in sync now. We'll see if you're in Chicago, maybe uh, we're getting there quicker. I don't know. Um, so I'm going to switch camera angles, Tom, to show you what's down here in front of me on the desk. Uh, I just want to make sure you can see this, but also you can see me up in the corner. That way you got eyes on me and you can see this envelope over my shoulder. But um, just a few simple shapes here, some symbols. These are uh, a few shapes to test this synchronicity, Tom. So right. just so we're on the same page, what these are, we got a circle, obviously a plus. That's wavy lines or bacon, Tom, whatever you want it to be. Okay, this is a square and this is a star over here and a matching set, matching set. So simple game, Tom. I'm going to think of one of these without showing it to you. I'll keep it hidden. I will uh, try to mentally send it to you, see if you can pick up on it. We'll go through all five, right? So you'll take a stab at one, I'll put it wherever you say, we'll go to the next one, so on and so forth. We'll go through all five. I'm thinking, Tom, if we are in fact on the same wavelength, if we're in sync, you will be able to pick up on all these and match them up five for five, 100%, all right? Sounds good. Okay, good. So just anyone who's watching, maybe curious or skeptical, they're not just in the same order. I will guide Tom through the first one, but I wouldn't be that obvious, Tom. So we'll start kind of randomly here with this one. The best way to do this is picture almost as if your thoughts are um, like blurry or out of focus. So you're not quite zoned in on any one thing in particular, almost like an out of focus photograph, right? But when I click my fingers, one of those shapes now comes into view. Which one is it? Uh, bacon was the first thing that popped bacon. into my head after you said it. Very good. Very good. Okay, so I'll leave it there with the bacon. So wipe away the bacon. You're on your own now that you get the hang of it. So I'll click my fingers, just let another shape come into view. Star. Star. Good. All right, I won't do anything now. Just hold this here. Take your time. What's the next one? Uh, plus. Okay, very good. And the next one? Circle. Circle, and that leaves the square. I always feel bad on the last one, Tom, and everyone else on the screen, because uh, technically you didn't get a choice on it. It's just a leftover, right? You narrowed it down, but you didn't get to choose, you know, technically where that went. So I want to make sure you have a choice on all these, Tom. This is optional, but would you like to make a swap? Do you want to trade any of these or just leave them where they are? They're good where they are. Okay, I just don't want you to be up at three in the morning and be like, ah, that mind reader, he didn't give me a chance to change. Um, Tom, look, the odds of doing this by guesswork, if you're just guessing, very difficult, very impossible, right? Because there's no process, no process. But that's why I said this is about being on the same wavelength. I had a good feeling about you, maybe that we're in sync. And I was hoping that maybe on a deeper level, you were aware of the shapes I was trying to send you, which means hopefully this should be uh, the circle right over here, right? And that makes this one the plus. That's the uh, wavy lines or bacon there. That's the square. And that is a star. That is all five for five, Tom. A perfect match. Got to be the Chicago connection. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, Tom's actually doing uh, entertainment at next week's webinar. Just so you guys know, he's going to be <laughs> displaying these psychic abilities. Um, let's try something. I think it's Sara. I heard. I want to make sure I say that. All right. Hi, Sara. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, so I want to try now, now that I'm, I'm kind of warmed up here before we do a quick group thing to round this out, I want to try something with you and it's kind of a, um, a game of influence almost. It's something I used to play back in, in college with my buddies just to practice these sorts of things that I now make a living doing. And, uh, the goal is basically to see if maybe I can influence a few choices you're going to make in a moment. And if we can arrive at the same target, I know it sounds weird. It's just this though. This is the target, just a little message for you. We'll see if we get there, but the game is very, very simple. In fact, it's all in your imagination. I just want you to imagine I have a few coins in my hand. So we'll say four coins total, a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. Now, I will tell you what people tend to do here. They either tend to think of the penny because of the color, um, the quarter because of the value or the size of it maybe, or maybe they have a lucky coin. So don't do any of those things. Don't pick off of that. We're gonna try to make this random. So the best way to do this is kind of go through in your mind and kind of cycle through penny, nickel, dime, quarter, but you can mix up that order if you need to. Just cycle through randomly for me, randomly. And um, as you're doing that, I'm gonna try to catch up with you and see if I know which ones you're going through in your mind. Okay, so in a moment I'll click my fingers and we'll say stop on whatever one that is. And that will be the one we'll use, okay? Whichever the last one you were thinking of is. That one right there, right there, whatever that was. What was the last one you're thinking of, Sarah? Dime. 
The dime. Okay, so this is a nice random choice you were going through. We'll say it's the dime. So I hand you the dime. We'll imagine you have the dime now. And you take that and you give it a nice flip up in the air. You catch it, put it over in the back of your hand and tell everyone if you lift your hand now and you look down, is the dime heads up or is it tails up? Tails up. Tails. Okay, very good. Very good. Now, just as before with Tom, I want to give you a chance to change. You can change one of those two things. Right now we have the dime tails up. You could either change the coin so we could have something else tails up, or you can change it to a dime being heads up, or you can stick with whatever you have. I just want to give you those options. I'll count backwards from three to zero. It's up to you, but when we get to zero, you have to have made up your mind. What's it going to be? Quarter tails up. I like it. Okay, so you did change. Tom did not. This is good. This is interesting. This is a, like I said, it's a game of influence to try to maybe influence those decisions. That's what this target is all about. So I want you to see here that this is a message I wrote for you earlier. It could have been any decision, but this is what I said. I said, the quarter will be tails up, which is very good. And I'm so pleased that you fell right into that pattern, which is fantastic. <laughs> Not too bad. Not too bad. Okay. Um, so we'll try some with all of you. We've got uh, five of you on screen and me. Um, so we'll start with Steven, then we'll and just in the order on my screen, at least Steven, Tom, Sara, Lisa, and then to Dana. Hello, Dana. We'll come to all of you and I will have, um, we'll have Dana make two choices because you, usually I do this either with three people twice or, or six people once. So we'll just have Dana make two choices at the end just to keep this fair. I'm going to come to you in a moment and have you each choose a number between one and 50. Any number between one and 50. A few rules, it's got to be between one and 50. Right. Also, uh, please remember your number, whatever number you say, just keep that in mind. I'll ask for them at the end. And then finally, um, make sure we get six different numbers. So by the time I get to Lisa, say Lisa had a number in mind, but Sara says it right before you, you got to change your mind to something else. That way we get six different numbers and Danny, you'll choose two different numbers between one and 50 to round this out. So any of you on screen can grab a, a calculator as well as anyone else watching out there who's not on screen with us. You can play along as well. I'll grab mine here just so we have it. We're going to do a quick calculation to get a number for today's webinar on we're going to start from the same place which of course is zero so there we are zero all right so we'll come to steven first and then we'll work our way through steven a number between one and 50 please 34 34 excellent everyone put in 34 there we go we'll hit times we'll come to tom now tom a different number between one and 50 oh i didn't i didn't hear you um not mute. Oh, you need to miss the button 49 49 is perfect. Okay, so 34 times. I thought we had our mental connection, Mark, so I thought yeah. I could just think it to you. <laughs> well, I know, but I, I want everyone else to be able to enjoy it as well. Um, so we'll, we'll, this is my total, 34 times 49. Hopefully everyone's matching. Okay, good. I see nodding. Okay, 1666. We'll hit times again. Back to you, Sara. A different number, please, between 1 and 50. You're muted as well. Two. Okay, so times two. Very good. Remember your numbers, 3332. We'll hit times coming to Lisa now. A different number, please. 12. 12. Okay, times 12. We'll hit equals. I have this number, 39984. Getting bigger and bigger. I'm going to make sure we're matching. Good. Um, I don't want to get too big, so we'll hit plus. Then we'll come to Dana. Dana, uh, you're going to make two choices. So what's the first one? A different number between one and 50? Seven. Seven. Great. We'll hit plus seven. We'll hit equals. Everyone make sure we're right. 39991. Good. And then we'll hit plus again. And Dana, a final number, a six and final number between one and 50. 22. Okay, perfect. So plus two, two. We'll hit equals. That's what I'm showing. At least 40,000. And 13, yes? Okay. And just because I'm on screen with you, like I said, I'll join in on this. I'm going to hit minus so everyone can hit minus. I'll look away to randomize this and just put in a few different numbers. Okay. And we'll just subtract that. That's perfect. Minus 18392. Minus 18392. And then everyone hit equals and then hold it up if you got it, just so we can show everyone our total. I have 21,000. 621, or give me a thumbs up if we're matching. Sarah, Sarah's got it. Steven's matching. Lisa <laughs> has it. Great. Okay, 21,621. Great. Just so we know, this isn't weird math. We're all matching, and hopefully out there in the chat, you've got it as well. So I love doing these virtual shows now. A year ago, I didn't know this was a thing. Now it's, it's the best part of my day because unlike anything else, I can't hit pause and walk away. I'm in the moment with you all, and every one of these is unique and different. So this group, the, the five of you and myself on screen, very different from yesterday or tomorrow's shows, right? Because it's made up of your thoughts and your ideas, which is fun. It, it keeps me in the moment. It keeps me present. And that means this number is very unique to you all. 
I like to call this today's number, right? Today's number for today's group. So that is why I made a forecast of what I thought that number might be. I wrote on a piece of paper and I put it back here inside this envelope. I think you'll find this kind of interesting because that is exactly the number I had in mind. That is 21,621. Not too bad. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I appreciate that. Um, here's the deal, though. I don't want you leaving just being like, oh, it's kind of cool, but it's just a random number in the envelope back there. So that is why I call this today's number and why I say it won't happen this way ever again and why it really does keep me in the moment because this is not just any number. It's actually this number. That's two for February the 16th, 2021. That's today's date, the date of this webinar and event we're doing right now together. So it couldn't have been any other number. It had to be this number. And last but not least, before I, I log off here, I know we're right at time health, so thank you for having me. Um, right before I log off here, I, I just want you to know that this is not a math thing, so don't go out later and be like, yeah, we had this mentalist on, he's just really good at math, okay? I, I went to art school, I'm not that good at math, okay? This is not a math thing, all right? This is about you all, you all choosing the right numbers. So four of you choosing one number, and then Dana, you choosing two, of course, but those numbers had to be those numbers. If they were any other numbers, we wouldn't have this total. And I only know one way to prove that to you. So quickly, I'll come back to, uh, I'll come back to uh, Stephen there. But Stephen, what was your number? Uh, uh, 34. 34, 34. Right. And then um, Tom? 49. 49. And Sarah? Two. Two. And Lisa? 12. 12, 12, there we go, okay. And Dana, both of your numbers. I think we got a seven and then- 22. Seven and 22, perfect, right. So those were the numbers, right? I only know one way to prove to you all that it had to be these numbers and wouldn't have worked with any other combination. And that is because there's actually something else back there in the envelope. I have to hold this kind of steady on Zoom, but I want you to be able to see, hopefully it'll focus here so you can see this. Um, but this, is a Powerball ticket. Now it didn't win, it's a losing ticket, but I think you will find the numbers on the ticket pretty interesting. So here's the numbers you just named back here. And you'll see this is what we have. We have a two, that's a seven, a 12, a 34, a 49. And Dana, that's lucky number 22. There are the six numbers on my ticket. It wouldn't have worked out any other way. Guys, thank you so much uh, for helping me out on screen today. And health, big shout out to you guys. Thanks again for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, thank Mark. you, Mark. Thank and you. thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.